I've mentioned a few times in the past that I grew up Jehovah Witness, and beyond that, I haven't really said much else. There have been many times where subscribers would ask me to go into it, and I'd always shied away from this topic for a few reasons. Firstly, my mother, who I love and respect very much, who also supports and watches my channel sometimes. I certainly don't want her thinking that I have any resentment or anger towards her beliefs. This woman raised me into a religion because that's what she believes in, what she puts her heart into, and for me to leave and then make a video that could sound like I'm tearing it down is just disparaging for no reason. She wasn't trying to get me into the religion out of malice. She believes that this path would be the utmost beneficial path for my life. Whether she's right or not about this worldview doesn't matter. Her intent was loving, which makes it hard to make a video about this as not all my talking points will be rainbows and butterflies. The second reason I never wanted to was because of that disparagement. See, it doesn't matter if I'm talking about Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons, Seventh-day Adventists, Jedis, or Flying Spaghetti Monsters. The thoughts that I came to about the world and how things work according to the way that I see them is not harmonious with the Bible in general. And that means that if you're Mormon who wanted to hear some negative points about Jehovah Witnesses, you're probably going to end up pissed off at the end of this video as well. Warned ya, let's jump in. Now first things first, I was Jehovah Witness for 19 years of my life. Growing up Jehovah Witness offered me a lot of positive growth, and it also left me with some awkward tendencies that I'm still working through. For example, one thing I'm really good at is forming arguments, and this is taught to you within the religion. They teach you how to argue through metaphors and analogies, which I've adopted from them. Another thing is my ability to talk to anyone. I can literally knock on anybody's door and engage in conversation without issue. I don't get stage fright either as I do Bible readings on stage in front of the whole congregation, and they teach you how to enunciate and speak which also came in handy when I was an on-stage actor. These are some pretty fantastic skills to have developed for me, and I'm grateful to have them. The awkward stuff, though, I make eye contact to a degree that people think I want something from them. And I guess people are awkward about eye contact? I've also lived in fear for a long time. Fear about saying the wrong thing or thinking the wrong thing when concepts like right and wrong don't even exist. It also left me with this idea that I need to find someone or my life is not going to be complete. I'm so quick to hope that the person who comes into my life is the one, and it's not entirely the fault of the religion, but they do push for early marriage, and whenever I feel incomplete these days, as though there's something missing, my initial thought is a partner, and that's because of that pressure. Now, I don't want to make this video about me and my residual Jehovah Witnessness. Instead, I want to start with the basic fundamental beliefs for those of you who don't know what this religion's all about. Jehovah Witnesses are very similar to other denominations of Christianity. They believe that there's one God and his name is Jehovah. Now, Jehovah is actually the English name for the Hebrew word for God, which is a word that was never spoken or written as it was so sacred to the Hebrews. Most scholars today claim that word to be Yahweh, but according to ancient text, it was never to be uttered. Now, Jehovah means love, but it also means I am that I am, or I am the one who is, which is fascinating to me, but I'll get to that another time. So, we have God, and God is alone. He makes his son, he then crafts angels after that, makes the earth and then the sun, then all life that inhabits our planet. After that, he makes man in his image and we ate from the no-no tree and were sentenced to death. To clarify, there is no trinity dogma in the Jehovah Witness teaching. God is not three, he is God. He has a son who's separate from him, and then the Holy Ghost is known as the Holy Spirit in the Jehovah Witness religion, and this is not a living entity, but instead a presence or energy that God uses to help guide us and keep us on our path. Jehovah Witnesses also believe that Jesus was killed, but not on a cross. According to the Witnesses, it had been more historically accurate as Romans used stakes to torture their enemies. Now, if you believe that it was a cross and it bothers you to think it's a torture stake, don't worry. It's little details that don't really matter. Now, the last thing about the religion that's different is the book of Revelations. This is the most psychedelic book of the Bible in my opinion, but again, we can get to my thoughts on the Bible another time. In Revelations, there's mention of a number. 144,000, and this number represents the amount of people who will serve with God in heaven once they die. So then, here's revelations in a nutshell for Jehovah Witnesses. Eventually, God will have enough with the evildoers on this planet. Jesus will lead a heavenly army to kill all of Satan's followers. This includes men and demons. Once everyone on the planet is dead, or at the very least those who disobeyed God, everyone will then be resurrected. Mostly. Those who disobeyed God in their life and turned away in an unforgivable manner will not be resurrected. For example, Judas betrayed Jesus and turned against God for 30 pieces of silver. He won't be making it to the sequel, but then take someone like myself. I turned away from God, so what would happen to me? Well, apparently, if I die before Armageddon, I'd be resurrected for a second chance. If I live my life and Armageddon comes and I'm wiped out by it, the chances of me being resurrected aren't as high because I lived my whole life against him. 
Not entirely sure how that all works, but that's as far as I know. So, God wipes out the earth, remakes it into a paradise as it was in Genesis, and then resurrects everyone who ever lived. The 144,000 chosen few will serve God in heaven and rule over the earth, and Satan will be locked away for a thousand years. Now, for a thousand years, we'll be tested, much like Adam and Eve were, and if we obey God, then we get to live. If not, we no longer exist. And after the thousand years is up, God will release Satan again, let him try to corrupt everyone he wants, and after that ends, Satan and everyone who chose to follow him will be killed. There's no hell, there's no permanent torture or purgatory, you no longer exist. And this is in a nutshell what Jehovah Witnesses believe. If you want more information, there's a channel by the name of Telltale that I'll link below. He's a bit more anti-JW than I am, but he goes into a lot of depth and history regarding Jehovah Witnesses, and if you want to know from they themselves, you can always go to JW.org to find out anything you want to clarify. Now, this next part is a story that I never thought I'd tell. This is the kind of story that I'd share with some of my friends, but it was never something that I thought I'd want to share online. It's just very personal, and the idea that my family sees this, I don't know, I just kept it a secret for so long. Uh, some stories are just easier not to share, you know? Well then, why share it, Barry? Why not just skip this part? And I would, but without this part, I'd have to lie about why I left. So, there I am, a good little Jehovah Witness boy. I don't cuss, I don't speak against God, I've kept my mind kind of tight around my beliefs, which, looking back, was kind of odd that I was so attached. I never really got too far in the religion. I was never baptized, as I felt it was an adult decision to make, and I was going to wait for that. I was the kind of person that if you put something demonic or gory or something that spoke against God, I'd get this deep feeling of dread pierced through my body. I lived in fear because I didn't ever want to do anything wrong. <sighs> Funny how you realize once you leave that life is about making mistakes, you really learn. Either way, there was this woman that I became friends with. I'm not going to give her a name, I honestly want to leave as many details out as I possibly can. Either way, her and I became friends, and when I turned 18, she started talking to me more. Now, I didn't know a lot about this woman. We were friends, but it wasn't a very strong friendship. Either way, one night, it's about 12am, and she calls me. She tells me that she's in pain and needs someone to talk to. Now, normally I'd stay away from situations like this, but I trusted her. I didn't expect anything to happen, and I went to her place. When I got there, she'd been drinking. She said that she'd been sad about something that had happened and needed someone to comfort her. Now, I know how this sounds. Barry walked in on the set of a porn, and that's exactly how it turned out. I didn't know what to do, and I was so ashamed of myself for what happened. Thou shall not commit a fornication was one of the Ten Commandments, and it was zipping through my head constantly. I was so afraid because of what I had done, and I couldn't forgive myself for it for so long. Now, when you make a mistake like this in the Jehovah Witness organization, the only way to repent is to tell the entire congregation what you've done. Now, it's not exactly like that, but it is. You tell the elders, and then you have to show remorse. You're reprimanded in some way, so everyone knows you've done something, and then you have to earn your dignity back through participation and going door to door and spreading the good word of God and all that. Now, let me tell you, I was absolutely not going to tell anyone what I had done. I was terrified of what was going to happen to me, how my family would see me. I'd done the worst thing that someone could do, and then it got worse. This woman never told me, and I had to find out from a third party, but this woman was married. Apparently, she called me over because she'd been in a fight with her husband. Now I knew that she'd been married, but I'd been told that the marriage was long over, and I came to find out that I committed an even worse sin. Thou shall not covet another man's wife. Yeah, I was a bit of a badass when I was 18, no big. <laughs> in all seriousness, it ate away at me and I sank further and further away from the religion. There came a point where I spoke with my mother and I told her that I no longer wanted to go. She told me that she could tell for a while that my heart had not been in it, and it was at this point that she was supposed to shun me. See, when you leave this religion, your family and friends are supposed to shun you. You're then left to fend for yourself alone until you realize your mistake and return to the religion. This is not a loving thing at all, and I'm so grateful to have a mother that truly loved me deeper than this rule that she was supposed to follow. She did try her hardest for me, though. There was this one day she took me to the Kingdom Hall, which is what the church building is called. <laughs> yeah, that's right. While well, you sissies were off at boring old church, I studied at Kingdom Hall. But either way, I was placed in the back room with a group of elders, and they asked me what was wrong, why my faith had started to waver. I told them that I had no proof of God, and in all the years of serving Him, I never felt His presence. I'd pray to Him, I'd ask Him for guidance, I'd consult elders, and I'd never get these questions that I had answered. Questions like, how is it right to test Adam and Eve like God did in the Garden of Eden? See, go with me on this because these are the kinds of questions that I'd ask. Imagine you're born into this world and your father was never around. You never had any proof of his existence except for this note that he left you. In the note, he tells you that he loves you very much and will always be watching you. 
He'll always be there for you when you win a school competition. He'd see it when you got good grades and when you tried your best, but he'd never meet you. He also leaves you a list of guidelines to live by, and if you fail to meet them, then he'll kill you. This is the first question that I'd ask, and I never get replies to it. The second one was, imagine your father comes to you and tells you that if you eat a particular fruit from this tree that he planted, that he'd kill you. Why plant a tree like that in the first place? First of all, God is all-powerful. He knew what was going to happen. Secondly, he made us in such a way that we're explorative and curious beings. Why the hell would you test a being like that? It'd be like if I took a puppy and trained it to understand me. Then I put a huge slab of meat on the floor and said, if you eat this, I'm going to kill you. But not only am I going to punish you, but every single successor that you ever bear. So then this guilt extended through the gene pool is justice, according to God? So then because my ancestors were slave owners, does that mean I am? I should be punished for the actions of a man that I never knew and most likely wouldn't have agreed with? That's justice? And it was questions like these, as simple as they are, that got the wheels in my head turning. What is morality, and do I agree that the God of the Bible is moral, just because he claims to be? How do you make these creatures and claim to love all of them, and then pick one specific tribe and tell them they're the chosen people, and that all the rest of them should be killed? Just think of the Mennonites, slaved and beaten, their historical books burned in the name of God, and a part of human history we'll never know. The Canaanites, who were completely destroyed by the Israelites because God commanded it. Jehovah means love, and that just never sat well with me. On that note, I have a joke for you. Why did the Israelite girl get excommunicated from the church? Two men a night. <laughs> All right, I stole that joke from Christopher Hitchens. Don't get too razzed about it. Either way, I'm in the back room with the elders, and one of them looks at me and offers me probably the worst advice that he could have offered. He said that when he was young, he too had trouble with these teachings. He said he left and joined the world, studied as many religions as he could, and once he did that, he realized that Jehovah Witnesses have the one true religion. As soon as I got home, I started looking into every other religion. I studied religion for three and a half years straight. The first one I looked into was Mormonism. Most of my friends were Mormon, so I figured this probably made the most sense. As I studied their teachings, I came to realize that other than it being an incredibly weird religion, it was fundamentally the same as the one that I was born into. There were tiny differences, but those tiny differences meant the world to these churches. I did this with Catholics, Seventh-day Adventists, and other Christian denominations. I didn't look as deeply into Eastern religions as I was still really close-minded about that kind of stuff at the time. As time went on, I ended up learning about agnosticism and atheism, and I ended up resonating more with those than anything else. It was scientific, purely objective, and rational, which was the language that I spoke best. I admired the honesty of it all. We do not make assertions without evidence. Fine, there may be a God, but he's given humanity no proof that he's even there. And until there's repeatable evidence that can be tested scientifically, I'm not interested in pretending that I have the right idea and others have the wrong one. Now, I want to take you into my mentality a bit at the time of becoming atheist. There were many things that I thought about, and as I opened my mind up more and more, I'd have larger questions regarding the teachings of the Bible that I could never get answered. For example, faith. Faith was always the thing that I'd lacked according to my religious compadres. I'd ask questions and I'd be told that I have to have more faith, but faith isn't worth a damn at all. For example, and I've used this before, but I can have faith that Russia is the best country and they should lead the world. Does my faith make it true? If I was Jehovah's Witness or a Catholic and you were a Mormon, I'd have faith that my religion was the true religion, or at the very least, I'd have to believe that your faith led you to an end result that was less correct than mine. How does that make any sense? What, so faith comes from God, right? But then God leads us in a bunch of random ass directions? But of a jerk now, isn't he? And what's the point of faith if it can lead people to do what Hitler did? Faith is a way of saying, I feel justified for no reason, and I'm going to use my God to justify my reasoning instead of trying to logic out why I feel the way I do. It's not evidence, and based on its track record, you'd think people would stop using it as an argument. Now, I could go in point by point here. Faith, prayer, individual Bible stories, sin, but we'd be here all day, and I imagine it wouldn't be too helpful. I just use faith as an example to let you into my mind at the time of becoming an atheist. I was an objective thinker with an ever-expanding mind, but I did still have my mind closed. See, it's kind of funny how we changed everything around. Imagine this, if you will. 150,000 years ago, we were a lot more primitive, very ape-like. We were murderous, we raped anything that twitched, and we had no fundamental basis for morality. Say then, a group of people decided something like, well, the sky shakes sometimes and it scares everybody. Why not tell them that there's an ultimate judger? Someone up there who tells us how to behave, and in doing so, we can form a society. 
So they develop a god that loves you deeply, wants only what's best for you and your family. I mean, he made us specifically. We're important and unlike any other animal. And if we disobey the teachings that this deity wants, then it will strike us down and torture us for our sins. Ha! <laughs> Nothing like an existential celestial dictator to keep us in line, and it worked. We developed a structure of morality that leads us into present day, but as time passed, this idea became too much for people. Perhaps a little too overwhelming. I don't like the idea that I was made sinful, that God put me on this planet on probation and I have to prove myself in order to be loved forever and enter into heaven or whatever it is you believe. So instead of seeking honestly for a better explanation for our spiritual desire, we just developed this idea of a dead universe that doesn't care. It's meaningless, lifeless, consciousless, and we're this rare blip on the cosmic timeline. And that made sense to me somehow. See, the problem with this is you're still left with questions that go unanswered. For example, when a being on this planet has a natural instinct or desire, there tends to be something on the other side to quench said desire. Case in point, how the hell does a baby turtle know to go to the ocean? It wasn't put in the ocean, it was put on the shore. Yet it decides, screw up my mother wants, and flees to the sea. It's a natural instinct to seek the ocean. Same way we seek food and shelter and companionship, why wouldn't we be content to just sit there where we were born and die? Yeah, we have an innate desire to survive, fine, but when you observe nature and find an instinctual pull, it's often because there's something there doing the tugging. So why then are humans so innately spiritual? It could be that all the centuries of forcing religions at ourselves, we just became accustomed to it, but even tribes that have never met civilizations like ours have deities that they worship. Now, you can just sit there and tell me that this is some weird form of human nature and I should leave it alone, but that's what religion told me to do and I'm not the kind of guy if you haven't figured that out. I have a question and I try to find answers, goddammit, and this has led me to some really interesting ideas. I want to just leave you with this analogy real quick so then we can move back onto the religion topic. There's a lot of us today who have a nihilistic idea of the universe, that it's cold and dead and meaningless, which to an extent I can get behind. The only issue is this sad nihilism that people are passing around. Everything's meaningless and therefore life doesn't matter, which is probably the dumbest thing I've ever heard. First of all, Mr. Smarty Guy, can you tell me what's beyond this universe? Let me take it even a step further and ask you what's beyond this dimension. Oh, you don't know? So then why the hell are you going to sit there and claim a thing like that? That's like if you sat down next to an ant and heard it say, There's nothing beyond me. Ants are the most advanced species around and there's nothing but meaninglessness beyond us. You'd laugh your ass off at this dumb little ant because as much as it tried, it can't see you. It doesn't know you're there. And even if you picked it up, it wouldn't have any idea of what's happening to it. You'd scoff because the arrogant little ant thought it understood the entire universe from its teeny little perspective. And until you come at me with more proof of this sad nihilism, I'm just going to call you an arrogant fool. But Barry, you may say, you can't make any assertions without evidence either, right? How can you be so confident in the idea that there is consciousness in this universe? And that's actually a lot easier to answer than you might think. I want you to imagine an apple tree. And if you eat from it, I'll kill you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I couldn't help it. So imagine that ignorant little ant that we talked about before lives on this apple in that tree. And he was so small that all he knew was that apple. Now, he claims that he's alive, but the apple that he lives on is dead. Just a dead rock that he came from. He also claims that this universe, the tree that the apple is made from, is dead. It makes sense to this ant that this universe is dead. But when you take a step back as a being like us, we know that apple and that tree are obviously alive. A dead tree would not produce life. Scale this up for yourself, Mr. Ant, and tell me you know for a fact our universe is sad nihilistic. I'm not at all going to claim that this is how things are, but if you study nature, you can draw more rational conclusions than you can if you just think, eh, humans are probably the smartest thing, I'll just say it's dead and the Big Bang made us and that's it. Fine, it's the most objective theory, but if you don't ask any questions about this, then how is it any different than letting someone else tell you how to see the world you're experiencing? Now I know that was a bit off topic, and I want to clarify where my mind is at now. I don't hold hard beliefs, I don't claim the universe is meaningless, I won't claim it's alive, and I won't claim that there's a god or not. I can only use what's around me, how this planet reacts and how nature reacts to make judgments on how the rest of the universe might behave. No matter what I've been told or what I've seen, I don't know if I possess the ability to truly believe it. I entertain things for a long time. I stew on them and it makes me go crazy. I really go to town on some of these thoughts, but that's all they are. Plagued by Pascal's wager. I am made so that I cannot believe, and in a way, I envy the religious for that. You have something you do believe, that you put your trust in, and it makes you feel a bit more whole and alive, and here I am chasing questions that may never have an answer. Who's screwed here? You tell me.